Hello everyone, my name is Nico Lehmann. I'm from the Humboldt University of Berlin, where I'm working at the Typology Lab with Professor Verhoeven. And today we want to present our Cochium corpus. This is a corpus for Yucatec Mayer, and we use a new model corpus architecture that we think is quite useful for indigenous languages and smaller languages in general. So we will present our main idea first, um, and then we'll talk about language data in general, before we will go on to talk about the corpus collection itself and our infrastructure. All right, so when you go into the field, you will collect lots of different data. You will have handwritten notes, you will have docs and Excel files. And if you have sound and video recordings, you want to annotate them. So you might use Prad for text with TextGrid or eLearn files. And all of these different um, files have to be managed well. That's really crucial. And our team, we found that it's become so many different um, data sets that we, that we needed to find a new way to combine them and collaborate on those together. And that's how we started off with this. Archives are a wonderful idea and everybody should archive, but there are some issues of for the data sets that we found in archives before. So one is the data for one single language can be scattered across multiple archives. And we think it would be better if people collaborated together and combined their data sets before they archive it. So this is one goal that we have. Also, accessibility can be limited. If you can't straight away search and view your data, the formats might be outdated. Um, or it might be hard to really get to um, the data sets because they are behind barriers, for instance. Also, usability, if you collect data from different researchers, uh, you can't really make a search across all of these data sets because the basic annotations are not going to be the same, naturally. In Cocoyum, we try to solve some of these issues by making it collaborative and cooperative and using it as a holistic um, architecture that talks about accessibility. But we use GitLab. We will show how this works. It's searchable with honest and visualizable as well. Um, we get lots of flexibility with salt and pepper who can convert to different formats. It's really cool. And with our standards that we developed specifically for this for Yucatec Mayor, um, it is reusable. You can add more data and you can add annotations. So with language data, you have to ask what actually goes into a corpus. Some would say it has to be naturally occurring language or authentic settings, or it has to be representative of the language. But this is uh, actually maybe not what should be asked. The question should be, what is useful? What do I need for not just my question, but what would anybody else also need? And what is quite clear is that they need literary texts. They are really useful in corpora. Also spontaneous speech and writing, no dispute there, I guess. But what about elicited productions? Those would not count as naturally occurring language in most cases. But I would argue that they should be included in the corpus because they are really useful resources. You just have to make sure that you can separate those. Also ungrammatical examples I haven't really seen many corpora that use ungrammatical examples as well. We collected so much um, data with ungrammatical examples and they're really useful. Why not make them accessible to other people by including it in your corpus set? So basically a corpus could contain anything that could be an object of language or literary study. However, um, we need to be sure that these different types of data can be separated and because you don't want to mix ungrammatical with grammatical examples, of course. Um, but in the end, it should be the user that has to decide what he's looking for. Does he want to include ungrammatical or elicited um, instances? Or does he want to focus on only spontaneous speech and so on? So this is one thing that we would strongly argue for. For language documentation, you would say it has to be a lasting and multi-purpose record. So this gives us exactly what we just said, varied records that give us diversity in the data sets and also a long-term perspective. So it's not just you that's interested in the data. Maybe in future generations, someone could use your data for someone something completely different. 
for a different purpose. And for this, the data set should be pre-processed in a theory neutral way and standardized. When you archive regularly, you will grow your documentation of smaller languages. Um, however, this could be really benefit from collaboration and united collections, because only then will the data of a smaller language really be accessible for future generations and not be scattered across archives. And this was also, also help empirical analyses, of course. Um, as a language researcher, we should, of course, not only see our data as um, for the scientific inquiries that we use, but we should make them accessible so they can work as language maintenance. We already collected so much data. These are great resources and should have more purposes. Um, for larger languages, we do have some really great repositories that have searchable interfaces like the DGD or English Corporate or ORC, for instance. The DGD is great because it includes lots of spoken data of German. Um, it's searchable, you can download, you can play audio and see basic annotations across different kinds of data. And it's really collaborative, so even non-researchers can add data, which is really great. However, for smaller languages, we feel that it's, these kind of resources are lacking. We rarely see efficient access to collections with searchable interfaces. But there would be so many benefits from this. So what if we share time-consuming and often expensive data collections and annotations? Well, we get a wider value for what we have done and let people use it for other purposes. The cost-benefit ratio would increase because we don't have to do the same work over and over again if someone else has already done it. And by enabling other people to add annotations to our data, we would benefit all from each other. So I think we don't have to do everything all by ourselves. Um, if someone is interested in syntax, they might add the syntactic layer. If someone else is interested in phonetics, they might add this layer, and together this corpus can really grow. Um, and combining those into collections, really getting together has the benefit of increasing the size for a single language, increase the diversity and the representative, representativeness um, together with that. And only then can we really study rare phenomena, because for smaller languages, if we have a small corpus, you will rarely find the phenomena that you don't see so often. So in general, our goal is to urge researchers to include all types of data to create varied corpora, to see their corpora as documentation itself, make them accessible for long term, and increase the efficiency of resources. Um, by combining our efforts and collaborating, this can really result in awesome corpora. But we need specific, we have specific requirements for the corpora to reach all of these goals. So one, they need to include metadata. If we have so many different types of data, we need to make sure that we can um, filter and have subsets. If these can then be searched, um, in, in a complex way, combining metadata and our annotations and so on in searches, that's really useful. We need to visualize it to see what is happening. And if we have especially multiple annotations, these visualiz visualizations have to be good. Cross-platform usability is really important to get access to everyone. Um, and versatility is then how we can collaborate and use these tools um, together. So the infrastructure by corpustools.org, they have great tools designed for sustainable corpus development, and we have based our architecture on their tools. And we will show you now how this works. So with Cocoyum, the collection is consisting of data from lots of researchers, collaborators already, and some more are interested. And if you have contributions yourself, get in contact. Um, we would really like to increase uh, the Yucatec Mayan corpus um, more and more. So what we get from researchers or collected ourselves are many different formats. We have books, Excel files, ELAN, toolbox, and so on. 
and our target format will be ANIS, where we can search and visualize. We will see that in a minute. The structure of Cochium um, looks as follows. We partitioned each data set, so many different texts, into subcorpora. Um, and we will differentiate those subcorpora by first the source, so the researcher or the collection where it comes from, and secondly, an aspect of the communicative event. Himmelmann proposed that distinguishing observed communicative events and staged communicative events, for instance, is quite useful, and also separating elicitations if you include those, which we say you should. Um, and this gives us a benefit of easily seeing what type of data is included in the subcorpus. Um, but of course, we have to make sure that you can search across all of these communicative events or only choose a subset of those. Um, and this is what we have included so far. Some examples is um, the YT corpus, such as the text um, with different events like OCE, SCE, and so on. And there are even other communicative events um, that are more specific to the data set that we have, like spoken edited data. Um, to get to norms uh, and standards, we have to look at each language individually. For Yucatec, as an example, you can see that there are many different writing systems. Um, these phonemes are written in uh, colonial style, academic style, and um, the communities and it itself decided on a standard in 1984. To be able to search across all corpora, you really need to be have one writing system, but you don't want to lose what someone else has done. Also, you will have different glossing conventions. So they might use set A and B markers uh, in Yucatec Maya for cross-referencing, or they might have other decisions uh, for glossing like subject or absolutive. Also, you might have different interpretations of what's actually happening. Is it a demonstrative or a determiner? Um, you need to make sure that you have a layer with one decision to search across all corpora, but you also need, can't lose what someone else has, has done. So the searchability of the older version has to be possible. And we did this by never deleting anything. We only add new layers when corpora are added to Cochium. Um, and this new layer will be focused on the 1984 convention that the community itself um, is using nowadays mostly. And we add this with a normalization layer um, and a morphological layer. And the glossing layer that we add, the GE layer in English, will use um, our interpretation of, of the glossing um, from our flex uh, lexicon. However, because there are so many layers that you can add, this is basically unlimited, we will never lose what has been there before. So if some other researcher wants to, to use their corpus with subject and absolutive, that's completely fine. Also, if they don't want to use the the Spanish J that has been introduced in 1984 in the Yucatec writing style, it's perfectly fine. They can still search this. Um, but across all corpora, there will be one version that's identical. And that's really necessary uh, to keep everything together. You can download um, Cochium on GitLab. Uh, basically, register at GitLab and then request access, and we will grant it to you. And GitLab is our choice because it has many ways for collaboration. You have issue tracking and version control, for instance. And we will have a short look um, at Cochium. So here you can see our, our GitLab repository. And in the releases, you get the release notes, and you can see um, what kind of changed um, in each new release. And you have issue tracking here, so you can create new issues. And this is really useful to work together um, in a team. All right, back to our slides. Now, let's talk about the infrastructure. How do we make this corpus happen? As a conversion process, starts with Elan and Flex. We use Elan for sound and, and transcription and so on, 
but then when we want to gloss we find it useful to use flex you can of course do this in elan if you prefer to and the next step would be to get to salt and pepper the conversion tool that exports an NS version of this corpus or of these files and we do this from elan by going over prat at the moment because there only exists an importer for prat but the conversion from elan to prat there's an export version in elan for prat so it's really easy and then this way we can get to anis however there will be an importer for elan very soon it's being developed right now so this will be even easier in the future and there can also be toolbox, toolbox imports directly into salt and pepper and then you can get to anis from there if you have a word file you will have to convert it to excel first if you have excel already perfect simply use a csv version to import to salt and pepper and then you get your um, great anis version and the good thing about this whole structure is that if you if you get to salt and pepper you can export it again to many different formats like tcf tay and tree tager and back to prat and elan and so on and annotate more uh, add more into annotations like um, or analyses or comments or so on and then go back to merge it with your previous version and then you're back to anis so this is really great to edit and add more data why do we use Anis? Um, first, it has a really powerful AQL query language. It can visualize primary data next to our annotations, like video and audio. You have multiple annotation layers, like tokens, spans, hierarchical and pointing relations. You can add lots of metadata to each text that is in your subcorpus. Um, it has a web browser application, so you can install it everywhere. And if you want, you can even use a server option where you basically have a link you go to and then you have Anis. And with salt and pepper, it's really versatile where you can add and edit data like we have seen just now. And this is how Anis looks like. It looks a bit taunting, but it's actually um, quite easy. Um, here are some data types. That have, that can be visualized like media and sound, keyword and context, dependencies, grid, tree syntax, and even discourse and analyses. And these can all be combined in one search query. So this is really powerful. Um, let's have a quick look at the Cochium corpus. So you can see here um, some examples of, of our corpus data. And at the bottom, uh, you have all these different subcorpora that we have included now, even a lexicon if you look want to look up a word. And at the top, you have a search field. All right. Now, um, metadata, like I said, is really important to differentiate between different types of data, like casual conversation, discussions, and so on. But also, in general, to have more information of how this data came to be and this can be integrated in searches in, in anis so this is really really useful uh, we make this accessible as a downloaded version in, in gitlab uh, because gitlab allows for collaboration as we have seen anis will be included in this download but you can also install a server instantiation and make your corpus available publicly or via login. This might also be coming in the future, maybe for Cochium. And you might also use other repositories, of course, um, archives or Zenodo. But then it would be best in our view to not restrict it, to make it easily usable and to combine it into collections for, of one language. So. Let's talk about the advantages that this whole process has. No loss of primary data because we have time alone sound or video, however you like. You have lots of annotations. It's multifunctional. You can visualize, you can add it and annotate more and add it to your corpus all the time. Um, you can search and export data to um, make different analyses. And of course, you're more accountable if you open your data, if you open up your data and let other people replicate or falsify your um, results. 
Um, if individual licenses can be assigned to each subcorpus and even to each text, um, probably more to each subcorpus, uh, we have lots of options of licenses in Cocoyum. And we would even say that sharing your work in progress, like with GitLab, and invite comments, invite people to insert issues and work together with you and not leave you alone with all this work, would be a really, um, really good way forward. Um, for this process, we provided a do-it-yourself template. So you can um, download this this documentation basically and it gives you a step-by-step -step guide on how to convert from for instance elearn or flex or toolbox um, on the second window you can see when you are in the elearn folder you start with elearn then you go to pepper and then to anis and it's described on how to do this which step to take in each um, in each instance of where you are at and we have provided example data so you can see how this should look like. So please use it and give us feedback if you have more ideas. Lastly, final remarks. We say we all benefit the most if we combine resources and collaborate, if we use an infrastructure to be versatile and accessible with our data, and it's actually not as hard as it may seem. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions about the workflows or Cocoyum, get in contact with me um, under this email address. And if you have any questions on the tools, um, Pepper and Anis and so on, there's an email address. Those people can really help you a lot. They are really great. So let's talk more about this um, later on. Get in contact and have a good day. Thank you for listening.